Welcome to Humanities Conversation with Rabbi Raphael Levine, Rabbi Emeritus of the Temple de Hirsch Sinai, and a citizen so loved in this community and so respected that the list of his honors goes on. To name just a few, the National Council of Christian and Jews Brotherhood Award, the Seattle Realtors Board as the Citizen of the Year of Seattle for all his good work, the Knights of Columbus Award for all of his work in promoting understanding between men and women of different faiths, and recently from the Washington State Legislature, the proclamation by the Joint House as well as the House of Representatives and the Senate of this man of goodwill that has done so very much in promoting brotherhood in our state. Rabbi today is going to share some of his ideas as religion, on religion, as a part of the humanities discipline. <laughs> In the conversations about humanities, the discipline of religion is a very important one. But there are a lot of people that ask the question, is religion really important? Marty, I know I am biased, but I think religion is the most important thing for mankind. But it has to be the kind of religion that recognizes the value of the humanities, of man and his potentials, and has to be organized in a way in which those potentials will, will, will be given complete freedom for development, not to be bound by any dogmatic creed, but the freedom of what religion was intended to be, to help man develop his own self-realization. On earth, in heaven, we trust to God. But Rabbi, with the really hurt in the world today, that much of it seems engendered by religion in Northern Ireland, in the Mideast, mm -hmm. there are those who will say, Look, Rabbi, how do you explain that? Religion, as we know it, is not what it ought to be. Certainly not what the great founders of religion had intended. And this goes for all religion, all the great world religions. The founders intended that there should be freedom for man's development, not to be imprisoned by dogma or even bibliolatry, the worship of the Bible. The Bible is supposed to be a way of life, and life changes. And unfortunately, the Bible hasn't, and the interpretation of it has very rarely kept pace with human need. That's why religion, or a lot of intelligent people, have turned away from institutional religion. Let me explain something here. Some time ago, there was a Gallup poll to test the American attitude toward religion. <clears throat> there were two questions asked. The first was, do you believe in a god? The second one, do you belong to a religious institution, a church or a synagogue? The answers that came back were 95% said they believed in a power greater than themselves, in a god. 
50% said they didn't belong to any religious institution. Now, in our state of Washington, it's even worse. Only 35% of the people belong to any institutional religion. So it isn't religion that, that's at fault. It's the way religion has been abused. I should say used and abused. And that's where the problem is. And that's what I've been trying to change as best I could. And now it's in the book that I have tried to write. Maybe some will read it, and maybe some will find it helpful. Because, see, one of the titles that I had in mind for the book was Man in the Image of God and God in Man's Image. The second part is very important because our concepts of God is what man's need, his outreach, his potential developed in a spiritual way, have created the concept of God, not God, but the concept, the idea of God. And that's why all the greatest minds have said that every man's God is his own. Okay. Now, there we get into so long you have been teaching comparative religion to all different ages of people. And when you teach other faiths besides the Jewish faith, for people to understand it. Do you think most of the strong faiths of the world, they have an optimistic view of what man's potential is? No. I think <clears throat> most of the great religions do have a hope for man's growth. The actual practice of it prevents the fulfillment of that hope. There are some religions that feel that man is utterly helpless and only God can save him. And they, of course, have for a long time, and perhaps Christianity has been more guilty than others in thinking that the individual constantly needs is, is helpless. Therefore, they never gave him the real chance for developing his freedom and his personality and his personal self-realization. That's the way I find, as I see religion. Religion is needed. As a matter of fact, I wrote a chapter in the book that I'm going to explain to you, Organized Religion, who needs it? Who does? My answer was everybody needs it. But he needs it purified, not the way it is alone. It has to be much more creative, productive than it is. Okay, can, but how can they go? Where can they go to get this direction to purify their religion so they can use it to it that way. Well, I think there are many places they can go into the liberal churches. And thank God, since Pope John of blessed memory opened windows for the Catholic Church to look upon the world and the world to look in upon the Catholic Church, they have been among the, the greatest, almost revolutionary, in their attitude. For instance, they are the aggressive ones in dialogue. They never thought of dialogue. They are the ones that opened up ecumeni uh, ecumenism. That means that all religions have their place and a very important place. That there is no one way to God. 
But Rabbi, in this decade we live in, more and more churches are moving more narrow in closing in and believing that theirs is the only way to God. Unfortunately, what you say, Marty, is right and true. I think that the closing in, even the rejection of Pope John's magnificent and worldwide outlook, they reject it. It's partly fear, partly ignorance, partly bibliology. I call those kind of religions enemies of religion. Self-righteousness, which in Christianity, for example, that's the most deadliest of the seven sins, self-righteousness. Nevertheless, they actually are self-righteous in claiming that they have exclusive revelation of God's truth, which is not only stupid, and I'm using an awfully strong word, but I can't use a lighter word. Uh, Rabbi, as a Jew, do the Jews not feel this, that they have the only answer and the only path to God? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, 2,000 years ago, the rabbis in the Talmud laid down as a principle that the righteous among all people shall have a share in the world to come, which was their way of saying, are acceptable to God and saved by God. It doesn't matter what they believe as long as they're not idolaters. The only criterion was to live by God's moral law, ethical values, spiritual outreach, in their own personal way. Oh no, we don't believe that everybody has to become a Jew. <laughs> I, I have to tell you the story. I was going to say, they have to be Jews at heart. Right. And that's, uh, that's the story. When I was a rabbi in England, the congregational minister and I became very close friends. And once out of the greatness of his heart, he said to me, Levine, you are a real Christian. And I thought for a moment and I said, I want to thank you, Partington, and I'll reciprocate that tribute. You have a Jewish heart. Which was the highest The compliment. highest thing we could say for someone we really respected and loved, regardless of what he believed in and how he worshipped. You're a great student of the Bible. How do you feel about the Bible? The Bible is a literature that covers 1,200 years. You can imagine that there are some things in the Bible that are very primitive, almost savage. There are also various stages of development, and the prophets are the highest, because they are the ones that make the Bible meaningful. Without them, the Bible would be valueless. Rabbi, I've talked to many students that have taken your comparative religion course, and they always say that they like the best the part about the prophets. Share with us some of this. Prophets were not supermen. We think that everybody in the Bible is a superman but they were the supermen of their age. And they were children of their age. But they were people who had tremendous insight and tremendous feeling and tremendous courage. Amos, for example, was the first of them. They were originals. Not all the prophets were originals. In my opinion, only five of them. That was Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Deutero-Isaiah, which were the chapters 40 to 55 of the book of Isaiah, who lived during the Babylonian exile. Amos was the first. 
and they were all seminal men. You know what I mean by no. seminal men? I mean they were original, absolute original. Amos was a shepherd and a farmer, and he knew about Moses and all the rest of the things that came down to him, the covenant, but he knew that God was a God of righteousness, of justice, and to him that appealed. And he saw that the people violated every one of the commandments. They worshiped God in the form of a golden bull. They trod on, on the head of the poor. The rich were richer and the poor were in the dregs. And so he chaff, challenged the whole culture and the whole religion. And he said that your religion is worthless. You like to go to the temple and offer sacrifices and do the observe holidays, but you're wicked. You're violating God's will, and therefore God is going to punish you. And he explains it in his book. And he said, if you think that God is only your God, that you're the chosen people, you're right. You're right that you're the chosen people, but not the way you think you think for special privilege <laughs> but you are chosen for special responsibility to be witness to god and not to violate everything that god represents anyway he was driven out of town then he also developed the idea that god was not merely a tribal god and in his book he explains he says you are no better to me than the Ethiopian, said the Lord, the black people. I brought the Philistines, your enemy, out of Kiel, even as I brought you out of Egypt, and the Assyrians out of Castor. But you only have I known, and therefore you're going to get it. Be punished for your wickedness. Okay. The second one was a totally different kind of person. There were younger contemporaries. I mean, he was a younger contemporary of Amos. He was a, a very kind, gentle, loving individual. And he had a domestic tragedy. He married a beautiful woman. She gave him three children and ran away with a lover. Well, it shattered him. And then he thought of the condition of his own country, which was racing with catastrophe. And then he saw that what happened to him was really God telling him something. He wanted to teach him how it feels to be betrayed by someone you really love. God had been betrayed by the people that he loved. He did everything for him, just like he did for his wife. He never ceased to love her. So he started, he felt that that was his call to prophecy, and he became a prophet. Anyway, he talked very much like Amos, condemning everything. But then, one day, he, he was walking by a marketplace and he saw a slave auction, and a woman was being auctioned off as a slave. And there was something familiar about that woman. So he got a little closer, and sure enough, it was his wife. Her lover had abandoned her. She'd gone down the dregs and became a common slave. So he bought her, took her home. All this is told in his book. Uh, took her home, and with tender, loving care, he rehabilitated her, and she became again his wife. So he soliloquized, too. He said, if I can do this for a woman that betrayed me, God must be infinitely more loving and gracious and compassionate. So he started preaching compassion and love and all that. Quoting God, putting in God's mouth, say, I will betroth thee, using the, the language of love. I will betroth thee unto me forever. I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness. So for now, if only you give me the opportunity, open your heart a little bit. I'll do the rest. So he added the dimension of compassion and love to Amos's statement of God as a God of relentless justice. 
He wouldn't accept that. He's a different kind of temperament. So each one of the prophets, the five of them, each one added a new dimension out of their own experience and temperament until by the end of the la last one, they developed what we call, scholars call, ethical monotheism, the belief in one God who rules the world by law and by love. Rabbi? Yeah? Do these prophets still make sense in this century? Oh, and they the make more century. than sense. They make more than sense. If we don't live by what they taught, we're going to go. We are racing with catastrophe. We in this country, we in the world. That's the reason why this book that I'm trying to write is an attempt, really, to warn the people. Not to warn them, but to, to get them to understand that we as a human race are inextricably interdependent. We need each other if we're going to survive. Therefore, brotherhood is not merely a pious platitude. It's the very condition of human survival on this planet. And incidentally, I didn't say this. It was Adlai Stevenson who said it. Rabbi, many people say that now is the time that we are all getting more selfish, looking only to our own needs, caring less about our fellow citizens. May I say, that is our blindness. And my problem with the church is that they haven't done enough to teach us the difference between good and bad as far as human relations are concerned. The whole problem of evil is man's inhumanity to man. It always has been. But we expected something different in our time. We've had two or three thousand years of education. All the great founders, Jesus and Paul and the prophets and the Buddha and Confucius and all these people who teach exactly the same thing. What's the point? If Confucius and Buddha and uh, the saints of India and Jesus and the prophets ever got together, they would be like this, one person in spirit. Because that was their teaching. And we haven't lived by their teaching ever really. But now it's a matter of life and death. The only time we know that we need the grocer or the other is if there's a strike. The, the only time we, we know we need a garbage man is, a, is a, all the area gathers the garbage. Nobody to, uh, to pick it up. Unfortunately, we have only been able to learn by tragedy, never by thought never by planning, only tragedy. And I'm, I'm writing the book. I don't think it'll make a, a dent. But there may be some people that may find in it what they themselves are thinking about. And maybe I'm, I'm channeling some of the ideas that we have to think about if we are to survive. It's just as simple as that. If you could have, say, two or three magic wishes to make people understand what all the prophets and all of the great teachers and leaders of the last 2,000 years have said, what, you know, what advice do you give for young people who are starting out on their direction of their life? Because you are very wise. Oh, I'm not. Uh, the only thing I would use Shakespeare well several things I would say learn to know yourself that's first of all also learn what your potentials are and what your limitations are 
and then be yourself. Shakespeare said it magnificently in, the, in Hamlet, in Polonius' advice to Laertes, says, to thine own self be true. Then it must follow as the day the night. Thou canst not then be false to any man. And most of all, not false to yourself. And Rabbi, what does it say on your walking stick? Oh, that's my conscience. Uh, well, there's the golden rule by Hillel, what is hateful to you, do not to another. Then there is a beautiful statement from the Psalms, how good and how pleasant for brothers to live together in harmony. And then this is uh, mine, but I'm not the first to, sh to say it, to love is to live. Jesus said it, the prophet said it, Confucius said it, Buddha said it, Gandhi said it. <laughs> Name the great names in human history. I don't mean the warriors, I mean those who represent whatever we think God means to us. And Rabbi, the mark of your life is that you have lived by this. To love is to live, and for all of those who know you and your reputation, you have lived up to it supremely. Well, I won't agree to that. I'll only agree that I've been trying. Thank you.